Um, the next item of business is a debate on motion 5235 in the name of Angus Robertson on Northern Ireland uh, Protocol Bill. I would invite members who wish to participate in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or place an R in the chat function uh, as soon as possible. I do note that uh, one member who is scheduled to be participating in the debate isn't in the chamber, which is uh, more than a little disappointing. We expect an explanation for that, but I call on Angus Robertson to speak to and move uh, the motion. Cabinet Secretary, for around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding uh, Officer. The UK Government's Northern Ireland Protocol Bill had its second reading in the House of Commons on Monday. The European Union consider this bill to be illegal. Many in the Commons also doubted its legality. Others warned it will undermine the United Kingdom's international reputation. Still more pointed out that it fails to bring the Democratic Unionist Party back into power sharing in Northern Ireland or advance trade talks with either the European Union or the United States of America. And yet, not a single Conservative MP voted against the legislation. I'll focus my remarks on three issues which are of utmost interest to all colleagues in this Parliament. Firstly, the issue of legislative consent, which Conservative members seem to have forgotten about when they told us last week that this bill was none of our business. Secondly, the question of international law, which itself is related to whether the Scottish Government can recommend consent. And thirdly, the potential direct impact and damage that will be caused to people in Scotland should this bill become law. Presiding officer, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a key part of the withdrawal agreement the UK Prime Minister signed with the European Union in 2019. Indeed, without the protocol, it's clear there would not have been a deal at all between the European Union and the UK. And so good was that deal, according to Boris Johnson, that when he signed it, he hailed it as a fantastic moment and went on to fight a general election on the basis that he had got Brexit done. Yet this bill unilaterally disapplies or affords the UK government powers to disapply the legislation that enforces part of the protocol in the UK. In other words, the UK government wants to tear up that self-same apparently fantastic deal and renege on the UK government's commitment and international obligations. And they want the Scottish government to recommend consent for the bill that does the tearing up and for this Parliament to agree to that recommendation. So to address the first issue very directly, it's inconceivable that the Scottish Government could recommend such a legislative consent motion. And that brings me to my second point today, the question of international law. It is the opinion, seemingly, of all except the UK Government that this legislation, if implemented, would breach international law. It deliberately sets the UK on an entirely avoidable collision course, our fellow Europeans in the EU, and leaves the UK increasingly isolated in the court of world opinion. Following the introduction of the bill, Commission Vice President Maros Sefcovic stated, let there be no doubt there is no legal nor political justification whatsoever for unilaterally changing an international agreement. Let's call a spade a spade. This is illegal. He was not alone in this view. It was a view echoed across European capitals and not just Europe. Senior US officials do not, and I quote, believe that unilateral steps are going to be the most effective way to address the challenges facing the implementation of the protocol. Most important of all, perhaps, is the view from Northern Ireland. More than half of the members of the Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly have rejected the UK government's actions as, quote, utterly reckless. So reckless in terms of negotiating with the EU, reckless with regard to the United States, and reckless with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Legal commentators tend to agree that these proposals could breach international law. This is deeply concerning, but not surprising. Not surprising from a government that in 2020 brazenly said that its legislation to amend the withdrawal agreement would break international law in a limited and specific way, as if that was okay. Jonathan Jones QC, former head of the UK government legal department, has described the legal position as hopeless. In reference to the legality of the proposed legislation, 
Let me turn to the Labour Amendment. Obviously, the Bill would still need to complete its parliamentary passage and be commenced by the UK Government to breach international law. And the legal position would depend on conditions at the time, as well as other factors and arguments, about which we do not currently have full information. But on that basis, I'm content, the Government is content, to accept the amendment. Let me turn now to the Scottish interests. It's clear that the Bill damages even further the UK Government's relationship with our largest trading partner. It causes business and investor uncertainty and risks sparking a damaging trade war. I cannot think of anything more irresponsible, presiding officer, than launching this confrontational action in the middle of a cost of living crisis and when the UK is at real risk of entering a recession. For the UK as a whole, it's been estimated that Brexit has so far cost the UK economy £31 billion. Pounds. We know Scotland's total trade with the EU was 16% lower in 2021 than in 2019, while its trade with non-EU countries fell by only 4% in the same period. Many of the difficulties faced by Scottish businesses are a direct result of the UK Government's decision to adopt a hard Brexit outside of the single market and customs union. Where our supply chains interact with EU businesses, be it for materials, for finished goods or labour and skills, this approach has made it harder and more costly for businesses to operate. Catherine Bernard, the Professor of EU Law at Cambridge University, has warned of even tougher times ahead and the risk of iconic Scottish products such as whisky, salmon, cashmere being affected in the event of a trade war. This is hugely concerning. Scottish salmon exports to the EU alone are worth £370 million and account for two-thirds of the sector's exports. Any retaliatory measures for the sector would be expected to impact many of Scotland's rural communities and supply chain operators. Clearly, embarking upon an utterly senseless and self-defeating course of action, the UK Government has provoked an unwinnable conflict with likely catastrophic consequences for many people. It's something that Scotland cannot, must not accept. The protocol, of course, allows Northern Ireland to simultaneously be in the EU single market and the UK's internal market. It is disingenuous for the UK government to claim the protocol is doing harm to Northern Ireland's economy. Stephen Kelly, the head of manufacturing Northern Ireland, just a month ago stated the exact opposite. I quote him, every piece of evidence presented so far shows a positive impact. This is echoed by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research which found that Northern Ireland's economic output has recently outperformed the UK average. Similarly, the chief analyst of the Ulster Bank has noted that manufacturing jobs are growing four times faster in Northern Ireland than the UK average. You do need to start winding up. I, I, I will indeed, presiding officer. Lastly, uh, just last week, the Resolution Foundation estimated that Northern Ireland will be the least impacted UK region in the long run because of its access to the single market. Presiding officer, the, for the reasons I've set out, I reject the amendments by the Conservative benches. Today's motion, as amended, asks the Parliament to take note of these very serious concerns and to urge the UK Government to draw back from its course of reckless confrontation, withdraw the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill and restart negotiations with the European Union immediately with a view to mutually agreeable and durable solutions. I ask the Chamber to support the motion. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I now call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move Amendment 5235.2 for around six minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Can I move the amendment in my name? I am genuinely grateful to the Scottish Government for bringing this debate to the Chamber. It is an important one, not least in terms of the integrity of the United Kingdom, but also regarding our wider relations with the European Union. It, it is tempting in a debate like this to refight old battles, revisit old arguments, whether on the Brexit vote itself or on the never-ending saga of votes in the UK Parliament between 2017 and 2019. Opinions vary hugely in this chamber and there were and remain passionate views about the UK's decision to leave the EU, even six years later, and there could be no doubting the seismic nature of Brexit and its impact on Scotland and the wider UK. But simply discussing how we got here 
is not going to take us forward. In the here and now, there are three issues that I say we should focus on. Firstly, the state of the protocol itself and the problems that exist with its implementation. Secondly, the need for a settlement that protects peace in Northern Ireland and restores power sharing. And thirdly, a genuine and sincere attempt by both the UK and the EU to reopen negotiations. Looking at each of these in turn, the state of the protocol. The protocol is not working. Rightly or wrongly, regardless of what the intentions were in October 2019, whether we voted for it or not, it is not working. There are four key issues at play here, and I touch on them briefly. There are problems with current custom processes due to the checks and paperwork imposed by the protocol. According to the Consumer Council, over 100 UK retailers have now stopped supplying Northern Ireland. There is undoubtedly an impact on business. The Fraser of Allender Institute and the University of Strathclyde modelling shows an additional average cost of 8 to 9 per cent for goods imported into Northern Ireland. Secondly, there are regulatory issues that place barriers between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which could potentially increase. And part of the problem there is that goods entering Northern Ireland need to comply with EU rules, even if they will not enter the single market. On regulation in March last year, I will very briefly. I've got a lot Pure to say. You has addressed and has proposed in joint negotiation the opportunity to do exactly what he's saying, uh, cutting uh, paperwork in half, reducing a number of the inspections, and indeed to simplify into um, a single three-page document some of the paperwork. Why on earth does he, does he think the UK government is not doing what his amendment actually says, which is to have a joint negotiation to make any improvements required? Donald Cameron. Say, I, I, I would like ideally for uh, negotiations to continue. But on the subject of regulation, which uh, Fiona Hislop raises, in March last year, a civil servant in Stormont said that the number of regulatory checks currently required on goods arriving into Northern Ireland from GB equates to 20% of the total checks undertaken by the entire EU, a fifth of checks. Um, thirdly, there are tax and spend issues. The EU state aid rules still apply in Northern Ireland, meaning businesses there don't enjoy the same support that businesses in Great Britain now benefit from. And businesses in Northern Ireland won't benefit from UK VAT reforms or reductions. And lastly, there are... I, I, I'm very sorry, um, but I just simply don't have time. Um, lastly, there are concerns around governance. Unlike other aspects of the EU-UK deal, where disputes can be settled through arbitration, any disputes arising from the protocol can only be settled by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And those are the issues that the bill seeks to address. That's why the suggested proposals in the bill, the red lane and the green lane, the dual regulatory regime, the governance arrangements, at the very least, we say, are worth considering. The green lane in particular should assist on the GB side, especially in Scotland, when goods are exported to Northern Ireland. That may be beneficial to Scottish businesses too. I, I'm very sorry, I, I've got two minutes left. I, I do apologise. Um, various proposals in the bill have been welcomed in Northern Ireland. Stuart Anderson, head of the public affairs at the Northern Ireland Chamber, said some proposals would be helpful, especially to consumer facing business. Secondly, I spoke about the need for a settlement that protects peace. Again, whether we like it or not, the protocol is inextricably linked to the political situation in Northern Ireland. We all know about the sh um, having grown up, many of us, even at a remote distance. Uh, in the shadow of the conflict that preceded the Good Friday Agreement. There is obviously uh, a paramount um, importance in maintaining stable social and political conditions for all of us. That means obviating the need for a hard border on the islands of Ireland and also ensuring as frictionless trade as possible. But it also means taking action to restore power sharing in Northern Ireland. We cannot magically wish the, con the concerns of the unionist community away. They have a right to be heard and air their anxieties. Of course, Northern Ireland doesn't involve majoritarianism. Both communities need to be on board. And critically, none of the parties there across the spectrum are saying the protocol is perfect. It requires flexibility on everyone's behalf. Yes, the UK government and the DUP, but also the EU and the whole range of democratic parties in Northern Ireland. Finally, there needs to be a genuine attempt to reopen negotiations the point made by Fiona Hislop uh, in response. Um, I was in Brussels with the Constitution Committee last week. We had many conversations in private, which I won't repeat. But what was clear was that discussions are stuck and need rapidly to become unstuck. 
Both sides share responsibility, the UK government, but the EU too has shown inflexibility, both in their approach to regulation of goods that I've mentioned, but they also have to change their negotiating mandate. They reopen negotiated settlements all the time. Where there is a will, there is a way. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I close by paraphrasing our amendment? The protocol is not working as intended. We urge both the UK government and the EU to come to a negotiated settlement so that these very real problems can be resolved. That's how we protect the integrity of the UK and the EU single market. And that's how we ensure that a stable settlement, safeguarding peace in Northern Ireland and allowing a return to power sharing can happen, a situation we all unequivocally should want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Cameron, can I remind members, uh, if you've made an inter uh, intervention and you still wish to participate in the debate, you may need to press your button uh, again. Um, and I call on Sarah Boyack to speak to a move amendment 5235.3 uh, for around five minutes. Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. When I was first sworn into the Parliament, I would never have thought we'd be discussing a bill that would actively break international law, because not only will the Tories' Northern Ireland Protocol Bill break international law, it also further damages the UK's global reputation as a trusted partner, and it risks worsening the cost of living crisis by throwing up further barriers to trade, and it will create further divisions at a time we need to be getting on with our neighbours in Europe, and we need to pull together in the face of Putin's war in Ukraine. Now, on one hand, the terms of the EU withdrawal bill and the Northern Ireland Protocol should come as no surprise to Boris Johnson and this Conservative government, because they negotiated it. They agreed the protocol and they whipped their MPs to vote for it. So the Northern Ireland Protocol is a product of this Conservative UK government. And the fact they're now seeking to usurp the protocol demonstrates the incompetence of this Prime Minister and his government, past and present. What confidence can we have from a government that cannot even get the job done right first time around? And yesterday, it was absolutely striking that the Foreign Secretary told the Belfast Telegraph that she has no regrets in voting for the protocol at the time and that the issues that have arisen were unexpected, even though she now says that the problems were baked into the protocol. So it really, uh, it really begs the question, what work did they do to look at a protocol that she now thinks is disastrous? What kind of risk assessment did they do? So I agree with the key points included in today's motion from the Scottish Government. So my ad amendment focuses on that fact that the bill proposed by the UK Government breaks international law. Article 29, 27 sorry, of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties says that a party may not invoke the provisions of its internal law as justification for its failure to perform a treaty. The proposed bill does exactly that. In the bill, the Tory government is seeking to unilaterally override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol through domestic, UK domestic law. Now, the irony of Donald Cameron's speech was I actually agreed with his suggestion that the UK and the EU should actually be sitting round the table and negotiating, not what this bill is doing. So, there is an issue about the doctrine of necessity and the legal principle. We may come on to that in this debate. But it's really clear that the doctrine of necessity only applies when a country is facing grave and imminent peril, and that the UK government's own formal legal adviser, Jonathan Jones, has already said that the EU would be completely unpersuaded by this argument. So this bill shows once again a Tory government totally detached from the real issues of the day, hell-bent on furthering their own political agenda, with no regard of the reputational risks they're opening our country up to. And a real irony, it speaks volumes, that the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, warned that unilateral attempt to scrap parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol and Brexit deal are not legal. And if you look at the protocol, Article, 9, Article 16 actually allows the UK or the EU to invoke um, restricted safeguard measures unilaterally where serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties arise because of the operation of the protocol. So I do agree with Donald Cameron. It is time to sit round the table and talk about this. Professor of Public Law at Cambridge, Mark Elliott's analysis of the UK government's legal position is that the UK government has no intention of using this provision. The Northern Ireland Protocol was put in place to ensure the Tory withdrawal agreement from the EU protected the Good Friday Agreement. 
And to date, far too many Tory MPs have shown completely dis complete disregard for the Good Friday Agreement in the Brexit process. And that is seen here from the very top of the UK Tory government. So Scottish Labour will not support legislation that not only does not respect international law, but it threatens the hard-won Good Friday Agreement. There is negotiation needed. And the irony, this is a real irony, while the Tory party claims to stand for businesses, businesses in Northern Ireland have actually been able to work with the protocol. And this bill risks creating new barriers in a cost of living crisis. And it will only bring more uncertainty for the people of Northern Ireland who are trying to make the protocol work in best faith. Surely far better to negotiate on food and agricultural standards rather than trade, uh, raising trade barriers. Presiding officer, this bill would break international law and have a devastating impact on families and businesses in Northern Ireland, Scotland and across the UK. The UK Government must focus on negotiation with the EU. That is the route to ensure that international law is respected and the Good Friday Agreement is protected. That means sitting around the table, that means negotiation, and it means doing that in good faith. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Boyack. I now call Willie Rennie for around four minutes. Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. We will support the Government motion today and the Labour amendment. The European Union has a largely unrecognised but central role in the Northern Ireland peace process. It formed a cradle with which peace could thrive. With Ireland and the UK both in the EU, it allowed a way forward to develop. The border between North and South could be removed for freedom of movement of goods and people across Ireland and with the rest of the United Kingdom. It was reckless for the now Prime Minister and the Leave campaign to ignore the extensive warnings of the consequences of removing that cradle. The Prime Minister was dishonest to tell people he had found a good solution. Because there is no good solution. Whether the border is north-south or east-west, there needs to be a border. And the border's costs. The protocol he condemns today was the protocol he praised three years ago. And the more the UK wishes to diverge from the European Union, the greater the pressure that there will be on that border. I would love to say there is a good solution to the Northern Ireland problems caused by our exit from the European Union, but there simply isn't. There are least worst options, and the protocol may be the least worst option, but it's hardly a model for success, which makes it all the more surprising that the First Minister holds it up as a template to aspire to. The chaos, the tension, the disruption is a model, according to Nicola Sturgeon. Last April, she was interviewed by the Irish Times. She was very optimistic about the Northern Ireland Protocol and, as always, what it could mean for her and her campaign for independence. Yes, I think it does offer some template, she said, and it would address any practical difficulties for businesses trading across the England-Scotland border. To hitch her independence ambitions to anything from Northern Ireland, I have to say, was brave. But to hitch it, not just now, but to hitch it to the wreckage of Brexit was quite remarkable. Because last month, the First Minister warned that the protocol could trigger a trade war with the European Union and tip the UK into, into a recession. The First Minister's model for Scotland has careered towards a trade war in just 12 months. So, just in a second. That's quite some trajectory. This only serves in my mind to emphasise the chaos that would ensue if we were ever to break up from the United Kingdom. And that chaos would only mushroom if Scotland were to join the European Union. And more so if Scotland was to likewise dramatically diverge as its wish from the UK standards on immigration and on business and on trade. The pressure on the border would be certain to grow, just like the pressure on the border in the Irish Sea if the UK diverges from the EU. But it also throws into sharp focus that the SNP are just not ready with a worked-out plan 
for independence. Now, the Prime Minister is playing fast and loose with the peace process, with international law, with our relations with our trading partners, with good local democracy in Northern Ireland. There is no doubt about that. But he has done so because he is in an impossible position of his own making. It looks like the SNP are trying to make the same mistake all over again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Jim Fairley to be followed by Paul Sweeney for around four minutes. Mr Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. Presiding, presiding Officer, when is an international treaty not an international treaty? Ordinarily, there should be a punchline inserted at this point, but unfortunately, the joke is on us in so many ways it is both embarrassing and dangerous. And I attended the Quality Meet Scotland breakfast meeting last week at the Royal Highland Show, where the First Minister gave a very well-received address to the farming and red meat industry attendees. However, what I found incredibly interesting that morning was the presentation from Professor John Gilliland. He is a former president of the Ulster Farmers Union and chair of DEFRA's Rural Climate Change Forum. His talk was interesting for several reasons, but one thing that really struck me was that almost in his first sentence, he congratulated us here in Scotland for having a viable working First Minister who was able to work on the behalf of the people of Scotland, because coming from his part of the world, that was clearly something that they would love to have. The Northern Ireland Protocol was supposed to be the tool that allowed them to have that functioning parliament that the majority in Northern Ireland voted for. And yet here we are debating the fact that, once again, throwaway lines and promises from Boris Johnson have proven to be nothing more than his usual speak first, think never routine. It did not matter so much when he was editor of The Spectator, but it absolutely does matter now when he is the Prime Minister. And now he is destabilising an entire country and threatening a trade war with the EU. It appears that there is so little respect from the Tories for international treaties, whether they were signed in 1706 or 2020, that they think it is okay to just ignore or break them and carry on regardless of the consequences. In the words of Maris Sefakovic, the UK government has tabled legislation confirming its intention to unilaterally break international law. And whilst it is bad for the people of Northern Ireland, leaving them without a functioning executive, it is also extremely damaging to us here in Scotland. It causes serious potential for a trade war with the EU during a Tory-inflicted cost-of-living crisis and puts at risk the vitally important trade of goods between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I know that the Tories are having difficulty this week with the concept of a political leader delivering on a promise made during an election campaign. But let me remind them what their own party leader said to the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland in 2018. We would be damaging the fabric of the Union with regulatory, regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland on top of those extra regulatory checks down the Irish Sea that are already envisaged in the withdrawal agreement. Now, I have to tell you that no British Conservative government could or should ever sign up to such an arrangement. Less than a year later, Mr Johnson put a border in the Irish Sea. Now, I have no problem with damaging the fabric of the Union, particularly in relation to Scotland, but I have a huge problem with a London-centric Tory government that thinks it can play fast and loose with the politics of Northern Ireland and the economic impact their decisions are having on Scotland. Boris Johnson does not care about Northern Ireland. He did not go there and make that empty promise because it was something he believed in. He did it because he was expedient for him, his party, his government, and at that moment in time. In October 2019, the Prime Minister assured the House of Commons that his protocol is a great success for Northern Ireland and the whole country, and fully compatible with the Good Friday Agreement. Now the UK Government is saying that this, legislative, this legislation to unilaterally override the protocol is necessary to preserve peace and stability in Northern Ireland. The man has more faces than a dice. Now, I do not raise that because Northern Ireland Protocol was the best solution for Northern Ireland. Like the majority of the people in Northern Ireland and Scotland who voted to remain in the EU, I think that recognising and enabling the democratic wish would have been the best solution for Scotland and Northern Ireland. But as I said previously, the Tories have a problem with recognising democratic mandates. And I return to Mera Mara Sefakic. The Protocol was the solution agreed with the UK Government to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions, avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland and protect the integrity of the EU single market. We know there are some practical difficulties implementing it. That is why my team and I have been engaging extensively with all stakeholders on the ground, resulting in a set of solutions put forward in October showing a genuine and unprecedented flexibility. A genuine and unprecedented flexibility, President Officer. 
It makes you wonder if Boris Johnson's vote fast is more about him realising that if the Northern Ireland Protocol works you need in Northern to wind Ireland, up, Mr. Fairley. it applies in Scotland too. Perhaps he's got more to lose than he realised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr Fairley, I now call on Paul Sweeney to be followed by Paul McLennan again up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I rise to support the amendment uh, in my colleague Sarah Boyack's name and also to support the Government amendment because, as the member for Adrian Schotts and I know only too well, we were, as veterans of the 2017-19 House of Commons, had a front row seat to the tragic, frank, the tragic and, and horrible spectacle of the constitutional vandalism perpetrated by the Conservative Party on this country. Um, and it really, as, as someone who was nine years old when the Good Friday Agreement was signed and has only ever really known peace in Northern Ireland, to see that threatened in my generation's prospects threatened by that is absolutely appalling. Um, and, you know, it very quickly became apparent to me in wrestling with the, the difficulties of that Brexit vote in 2016, of how do you make sense of it? How do you deliver a workable solution? There was only really ever three options. It was either for the whole of the United Kingdom to remain in the customs union single market, or it's certainly very closely aligned to it, or to have a hard border somewhere, either in two locations, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, or between the island of Ireland and Great Britain. And the fact that then the Conservatives, Theresa May and then later Boris Johnson, made three promises which were logically incompatible. I kind of summarise it as the Brexit trilemma. Um, that promise one was leave the single market and customs union, but to have no border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and also to have no border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. I'm afraid that was simply impossible to achieve. So something had to give, and the fantasy that this could be squared off was something that you know, was impossible to deal with in that parliament, and that led to the disastrous outcome of the 2019 general election and the sort of no-deal Brexit that we ended up with in, in all but name. So option A really was the 2019 withdrawal agreement, what ended up with the Northern Ireland Protocol that Johnson negotiated with the EU, but it broke... Um, a promise to have no border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So he lied to the DUP as you know, erstwhile partners in sustaining the Conservatives in power um, as, the EU, sorry, as the UK agreed to a de facto customs border in the Irish Sea um, with checks on goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So now Johnson brazenly and outrageously denies that he agreed this and thus to try and cover his tracks threatens to renege on the deal. And if the, e if the UK does renege on the withdrawal agreement with the EU, ultimately this undermines the Good Friday Agreement by forcing a return to a border in, on the island of Ireland and thus breaks promise three with not having a border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And this effectively results in a no-deal Brexit, an economic disaster for the UK. Um, and the US, of course, would never sign a trade deal with the UK if it does this. But the UK will then try and claim that the EU is to blame for this disaster and this border. And that is the most outrageous lie perpetrated on the people of this country, who perhaps voted in good faith for what they thought was you know, against uh, EU bureaucracy and everything, but they didn't fully understand the implications of this problem that would be faced with Ireland. And of course, Theresa May's 2018 deal with the Irish backstop, that deal pretended to achieve a fantasy which would square it off, but in reality it actually would have kept the whole of the UK de facto in the EU customs union and single market for goods if no other solution could be found. And it would have broken, of course, the promise to leave the single market and customs union. She was held hostage, effectively, by our backbenchers. So this was rejected by the UK Parliament, despite, and I'm proud to have said that I worked as, po as much as possible with colleagues across parties to achieve as much as we could in compromise to get that agreement to remain in the customs union and single market, to try and achieve that alignment. Ken Clark's proposal, for example, tried to work as much as we could, but the Vandals in the backbenches of the Conservative Party put paid to that, leading to May's resignation, Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister, and the whole thing unravelling. So, in reality, what we saw through 2017 to 19 was the most appalling constitutional vandalism, and we're trying to wrestle with the consequences of it. That's why we should reject it and reject everything the Conservative Party have visited on this country, the misery they've visited on this country over the last five years. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Sweeney. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Claire Adamson um, for around four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. 
President, officer, just, just to clarify that I, I was told I wasn't speaking today because it was cut. So I, I do have a speech, and I'm prepared to make the speech. But I was told I wasn't speaking today after a number of you, speakers. You was have. Cut. You're on my list. You've been called to speak. That's I'll fine. Take that as permission, Mr. Yeah, McClendon. I just wanted to clarify that. So I'll thank the Deputy President, officer. Well, thank you, Deputy President, officer. It's been a long six years since Scotland voted by the margin of 62 to 38 per cent to remain in the EU. Indeed, polls have shown that support for rejoining the EU is now higher than that. Let's remind ourselves of what the protocol does. It creates a border in, in the Irish Sea for goods passing from the UK into Northern Ireland, which remains the EU's single market for goods. And we've heard about the benefits from Northern Ireland over that already. It also removes the need for border checks on the Irish land border. On Monday, Boris Johnson secured a 74-vote majority for a bill to rip up the Northern Ireland element of his Brexit deal. And remember, he authorised its approval. More than 70 Tory MPs either abstained or were excused from voting. These included Theresa May, former Northern Ireland Secretaries Julian Smith and Karen Bradley, and former Attorney General Geoffrey Cox. Theresa May led criticism of the protocol, uh, protocol bill, condemning it as illegal and warning that it would damage Britain's standing off the world. Theresa May said of the bill, and I quote, This bill, in my view, is not legal under international law. Won't achieve its aims and diminishes, uh, diminish, uh, diminishes the standing of the UK in the eyes of the world. Simon Hoare, Tory chairman of the Commons Northern Ireland Committee, said the bill appeared to be a muscle flex for a future leadership bid by Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary. The EU has warned Britain against unilaterally ripping up the protocol, and they would respond to the bill by restarting legal proceedings against the UK and threaten to use all measures at its disposal, including a potential trade war, if London acted to unravel the protocol. In regard to the impact of Brexit, the Centre for European Reform, the CER, modelled the economic performance of the UK that remained in the EU, using data from countries like the US, Germany, New Zealand, Norway and Australia, whose performances were similar to the UK before Brexit. It then compared this with real performance of the UK economy since the referendum six years ago. The CER concluded by the end of the last year, the UK economy was 5.2 per cent or £31 uh, billion pounds smaller than it would have been had it stayed on in the EU. Investment by business and government was 13 per cent lower, and goods trade 13 per cent lower also. Last year, the Prime Minister promised the UK was on the way to becoming a high-wage, high-productivity, low-tax economy. The evidence suggests so far it's delivering the opposite. John Springford, Deputy Director at CIR, commented, if the economy is 5 per cent smaller than it would have been otherwise, then we are all 5 per cent poorer. It also means that taxes have to rise to fund the same quality of public services we had before. And I quote, that's given us a backdrop to the Chancellor's decision to raise the overall tax burden to levels that we haven't seen since the 1960s. Resolution Foundation think tank in a report in collaboration with the LSE had said that quitting the EU would make Britain poorer during the 2020s. They also specifically highlighted the impact on, on the fishing industry. And I quote, which is largely based in Scotland, is expected to decline by 30 per cent and some workers will face painful adjustments. Presiding officer, in conclusion, Brexit has proved disastrous for the Scottish economy, and now the UK government is risking a disastrous, a disastrous trade dispute with the European Union. Scotland is in the midst of a Tory cost of living crisis, and the UK is hurtling towards a uh, recession. The total trade in goods and services, the trade deficit, has widened by £14.9 billion to £25.2 billion in quarter one of this year, reaching the lar largest deficit in the records began in 1997. This is a devastating impact of Brexit. The UK Government needs to withdraw the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill and restart negotiations with the EU immediately. There is, of course, a solution on the horizon. Scotland will retain its independence on 19 October 2023, start negotiations to rejoin the EU and become part of the European family as an equal partner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call uh, Claire Adamson to be followed by Ross Greer for around four minutes. Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Or oh, with some power, the gift of gear is to see ourselves as others see us. Presiding officer, I have visited Brussels twice recently, as mentioned by my deputy convener, uh, in as many months uh, I, to the, the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly and also in a fact-finding visit for the committee. I have seen at first hand how Europe and the wider world sees the UK, sees us. In short, the UK is seen as not to be trusted. If it enacts the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill unilaterally, it will be viewed internationally as a rogue state. This bill represents a huge threat, not just to Northern Ireland, but to Scotland's economy, our competitiveness and our consumers. 
That's our constituents. Scotland exports such as whisky, salmon and cashmere could be affected. Industries that are already having to contend with post-Brexit chaos. The most recent National Institute of Economic and Social Research quarterly outlook states that the states that the closer links with the EU through the trade and potential labour mobility have benefited Northern Ireland post-Brexit. Northern Ireland is shielded because it was given compromise, a compromise sought for Scotland, but denied as we are tethered against our will to Brexit. So the question from my Conservative colleagues is, qui bono, who benefits from these decisions? The decision to leave the EU, the subsequent decision not to progress the implementation of the protocol, and now the decision to unilaterally introduce this bill. A bill that rips up a protocol that was agreed, and a protocol that Boris Johnson and his Tory acolytes were hailing as a triumph at the time. It was negotiated in good faith between Westminster Government and the EU Commission, but by reneging on the first serious international treaty post-Brexit, the Tories will do irreparable damage to the UK's international standing. The Commission has announced new infringement proceedings against the UK Government over the alleged failure to, to um, implement uh, the staff border and control posts at the Northern Ireland ports and to provide real-time data on the movement of go goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Can I say to Mr Rennie, this, is, this was suspended infringement proceedings that have been re-enacted because of the bad faith of, this, of the UK Government. And having been in the room during the PPA, I heard the, the representation from the EU and from the, U the UK delegation, and the EU are incredulous that having solved the medicines issue and negotiated using what is there within the protocol to solve the, th these difficulties, that the UK seem not even to have responded, as Ms Hislop said in her intervention, responded to the new um, proposals from the EU to make this work, to get round that table. And it is the UK that is the problem in this negotiation being taken any further. Mr Simkovic's comments have been, have been laid bare. He has, has, has told us how, how this would be an illegal and it could provoke a trade war. So the UK government, in its bad faith, is, is willing to put Horizon at further risk, is willing to put the Good Friday Agreement at further risk is putting the commerce of our country at risk while our voice is silenced because in the PPA, the Senate, North Stormont and Holyrood do not have a voice in that room. So everybody sits there talking about Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland did not have a voice in that room. This is untenable and it's a democratic deficit that is only going to get worse. Thank goodness we have a path out of this, Guruk. Thank you, Ms Adamson. And I call Ross Greer to be followed by Fiona Hislop for around four minutes. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been a, a member of the British-Irish Parliamentary Assembly for six years now. It's an institution that predated the Good Friday Agreement by a couple of years, but it fulfils the role of inter-parliamentary dialogue that's required under Strand 3 of the agreement. It is one of the institutions of the peace process. And it's been a privilege through that to get to know some of those who secured that peace agreement in the first place, who put themselves at immense risk to secure that better future for their families and their society. But Brexit has defined all of the six years that I've sat on BIPA to the immense frustration of most members when there are so many other issues about the relationships on these islands that we could have been discussing. It's been like Groundhog Day, every meeting trying over and over again to square the circle of an open land border between two markets and an open sea border between different constituent parts of the UK. There's been little to no understanding from the UK government of the fact that the peace process is just that, a process. It is still ongoing. It was not an event in 1998. And the Good Friday Agreement is an international treaty, not an internal political agreement in the UK between different parties and combatants to that conflict. The protocol is the least worst solution. It's not the problem. Brexit itself was always the problem here. But the protocol is the solution that the Brexiteers chose and signed up to. It was part of their oven-ready deal. Now, the protocol is working economically for Northern Ireland, as has already been pointed out, on a range of measures that's outperforming the rest of the UK. 
It is causing political instability. That political instability, though, is being caused by the Democratic Unionist Party leading political loyalism down a dead end. The DUP, by the way, who barely engage with the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. Now, I spoke to Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the DUP, earlier this year about this issue. And to be fair to Mr Donaldson, he's the one DUP member who I've seen engage properly with the institutions of the peace process. But when I asked him about the DUP's proposed alternatives to the protocol, all I got back was vague talk of technological solutions. We've been there before. That was most of the discussion with Brexiteers for the last six years. Now, if this was purely about resolving economic issues, there are technological solutions. The border between uh, Norway and Sweden is an excellent example of a high-tech solution to a customs border. But we know that that's not a solution in the north of Ireland because it would require immense amounts of physical infrastructure, something that's clearly not compatible with the peace agreement. Now, the DUP have whipped up political loyalism. They're now being punished by it as a result of that. A number of loyalists fairly understandably feel that they've been sold out as part of this process. Northern Ireland's changing. The institutions are premised on a unionist nationalist divide. They're going to need reconfigured now. Political unionism has lost its majority and it's highly unlikely to get it back. But political nationalism is not much closer to securing a majority of its own. A different configuration is required for Stormont. But there's no space for that discussion as long as Brexit makes this crisis permanent. If polling is correct, Irish unity is perhaps closer than ever. That's not an issue for us to weigh in on, but I highly doubt it was an intended consequence by those who led us here from Downing Street. But the situation in Northern Ireland is being made worse by Tory brinkmanship. At best, it's about strengthening their negotiating hand with the EU, though that would be a shameful way of going about it, because it plays into the hands, who don't, uh, the hands of the people who don't want peace, who never wanted peace in the North of Ireland. But more likely, it's just about holding on to the keys to number 10. Boris Johnson constantly feeding the Brexiteer wing of his own party and wider support base a constant diet of confrontation with Brussels. If it is about negotiating strength, though, there's another profound mistake being made there. The EU faces immense challenges to the rule of law in Poland and Hungary. They can't credibly deal with those which they fully intend to do without taking action against a partner who's also breaching international law and agreements. Brexiteers think this issue sits in isolation. It does not. The same mistakes have been made over and over again since 2016, mistakes rooted in British exceptionalism. The risk of a trade war here is real. That would result in huge suffering on top of the cost of living crisis. The UK wouldn't win that trade war. We're on the precipice of recession anyway, and that would tip us over. The solution to this was here from the start, the UK staying in the single market and the customs union. Boris Johnson was elected on a uh, promise to get Brexit done, but he's guaranteed that it will never be over. The UK government intend on doing this on the basis of the necessity principle, but the necessity principle is a justification for breaching international law presiding officer. It is an admission that that is exactly what they intend on doing. The EU still want to negotiate. That requires the UK turning up and having proposals. They don't want a trade war. You need to we wind up now, Mr. A trade war. Today, this parliament will state overwhelmingly that this is not happening in our name. There's still time for the UK government to withdraw, but if not, the Conservatives must own the consequences of their actions. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. We now move to the final speaker in the open debate. Fiona Hislop for around four minutes, please. Presiding officer, why is this important and what is at risk? Why uh, it affects Scotland and how it must be resolved? The key questions. The risk of an EU trade war and its implications are very real, as others have already warned. The EU has willingly not implemented a number of things which are part of the withdrawal agreement in the spirit of cooperation. But if they now choose to implement the letter of it because of the UK's behaviour, it will have wider consequences. I'm hearing, for example, that the European Commission's Copernicus programme may now cease to involve UK researchers and academics in working on satellite monitoring of climate change impacts on seas and polar ice and forestation. And the UK is knowingly prepared to risk this participation as well as risk a trade war. Of course, Northern Ireland is currently the best performing part of uh, the UK, uh, precisely because it continues to have easier access to the single market. Simon Coveney, uh, Ireland's Foreign Minister, has stated clearly the situation of the Protocol Bill. 74% of people in Northern Ireland want an EU-UK agreement on protocol implementation, not unilateral legislation in breach of international law. It will damage the Good Friday Agreement, not protect it. It is a breach of international law and will damage the UK's reputation. It's against business and majority opinion in Northern Ireland and it's unnecessary UK unilateral action when partnership and compromise is on offer from the EU. Blunt, 
but accurate. Theresa May, in her searing contribution on Monday, said, in thinking about the bill, I started by asking myself three questions. First, do I consider it to be legal under international law? Secondly, will it achieve its aims? Thirdly, does it at least maintain the standing of the United Kingdom in the eyes of the world? My answer to all three questions is no. That is even before we look at the extraordinarily sweeping powers that the bill would give to ministers." End quote. Joanna Cherry, MP, in an important intervention on Liz Truss, referred to a gaping hole in the UK government's legal defence, as the International Law Commission has stated that where a state it has itself contributed to the situation of necessity, the doctrine of necessity cannot be prayed in aid. But the UK government is arguing the self-defence of necessity for something that they themselves deliberately instigated. International standing matters. The rule of law matters and the rule of international law matters on a global scale. Is the UK a trusted partner who will honour their agreements? Former Labour Welsh First Minister Carmen Jones wrote the following in an article only last week, and I quote, Britain is beginning to look more and more like a kind of rogue state. The Prime Minister can break the law with impunity without consequence. Ministers, when challenged, want to remove uh, the source of that challenge, the state wants to pick and choose what parts of international agreements it wants to abide by and those it wants to ditch. All this gives the impression to the world of the UK slowly falling apart and cannot be relied on to keep its word. End of quote. So, to go back to my questions, why is this important? International agreements, rule of law, UK reputation. What is at risk? The ongoing peace in Northern Ireland and the restoration of power-sharing democratic government there. Why does it affect Scotland? Scotland is proportionally more reliant on EU exports. Our food, drink, agriculture and other industries will be damaged if the EU implements the customs rules that the UK have signed up to but the EU has not yet fully implemented. So how must it be resolved? Diplomacy. Serious diplomacy, not arrogant posturing and politicking, discussion and negotiation between both parties, the EU and UK together. And I welcome the sentiment of what David Car uh, Donald Cameron was saying. Brexit isn't done. Brexit is still with us. It's happening. It's causing economic loss, curbing exports to the biggest market in the world. It's causing staffing shortages in key industries, exacerbating inflation. And, President Officer, in closing, worst of all, is undermining and rejecting the democratic wishes of the people of Northern Ireland who voted for parties who want the protocol to continue. And it is damaging to the upholding of democracy and the rule of law and the UK's international reputation. Support the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Hislop. We move to the wind-up speeches and I call uh, Sarah Boyack for around four minutes. Boyack. Thanks very much, presiding officer. It is extremely disappointing, as many speakers have said today, that we are debating a proposed bill that would break international law. But I think there were some really good points that need to be re-emphasised. I think one of them was incompetence. Um, several speakers across the chamber have highlighted that the challenges with the operation of this protocol are actually challenges of the Conservative government's own making. They negotiated and voted for the protocol, and they're now taking a wrecking ball to their own deal, but also critically to our own relationship with our European neighbours. And th the irony is there is a way out of this mess, and that is through negotiation, because times change, experience needs to be learned from, and dogmatically sticking to previous decisions in the face of workability is unrealistic. But so too is change via a wrecking ball. I thought the points that Claire Adamson made about the deal of medicines was really important. There is a willingness to work together. Um, and the, if you look at the Northern Ireland businesses and the dairy farmers in particular, there are issues that they would like to see addressed. Now, sorting out problems would require both the European Union and the UK government to work together to make compromises. But that is how negotiations work. And it's through sitting around the table and having those kind of realistic discussions that you actually get progress. The rule of law has also been mentioned several times um, on the legality or rather illegality of this bill. And it is clear that the bill would break international law. But I think one of the things that worries people across the, the chamber today is about what happens next on the Good Friday Agreement. It was built on the parity of esteem for both communities. And the UK government needs to now outline what they're actually going to do 
to respect the Good Friday Agreement because that's what the protocol agreement was meant to do. So they need to, it's on them, they need to talk about it. Several MSPs have rightly uh, raised the risk of trade war. Um, and I think that's something that is really concerning our businesses at the moment. The adversarial manner in which the Tory government is acting could lead to retaliatory measures from the EU, and that would affect all of us. It would increase the uncertainty business are, uh, businesses are already dealing with, and many businesses are currently struggling. So it's people up and down the country who are going to have to face the consequences with miserly help at this moment from the UK Tory government. It's actually been reported that the Treasury has drawn up an economic impact assessment for this disastrous course of action. So I think the UK government needs to publish that analysis now and reflect on it. Because it's writing us out potentially of organisations and um, opportunities to work together in research and development, Horizon, other programmes. So there are so much, there's so much that is at risk, presiding officer, from this proposed bill. That is why we cannot support it as Scottish Labour. And it's to be expected over the coming months that we're going to have debates about independence being the only solution for Scotland. In reality, the issues facing communities and businesses in Northern Ireland would simply move to Gretna and Berwick under the SNP Green Independence Plans. And the points made by Willie Rennie about the risks of independence were well made. There's a gap between what you have as your ambitions and a reality check. And Brexit shows the, the tragedy of actually advocating something and not actually owning up to the divisions it potentially creates. It's a warning for all of us. And Paul Sweeney's reflections on trying to find workable solutions when he served in the UK Parliament are really important to us. There's a gap between promises and reality of separation. And what we need to be thinking about is interdependence, constructive dialogue, negotiations, to put the interests of all of our constituents first. That should be everyone's priorities. A future Labour government would scrap this bill and get around the negotiating table with our European neighbours. We are never going to agree on everything, but we have to work together, respect each other, rebuild the trust and goodwill that's been demolished by the Conservatives and provide certainty for communities in Northern Ireland and across the UK but put the effort in, make the effort to work together and actually be honest about the challenges we face. And that's not happening at the moment. We urgently need change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. I now call on Sharon Dowie for around four minutes. Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all want to see a resolution to the situation in Northern Ireland. It's in the interest of all parties, all four nations of the UK, as well as the EU, that we come together to address the issues which have become apparent in the Northern Ireland Protocol. In its current state, it is stifling trade, has caused major, major issues around the supply of essential medicines and is an active problem in resolving the delicate matter of power sharing at Stormont, itself something that threatens to destabilise the Good Friday Agreement, one of the very things the Protocol was created to protect. No. That is not to say aspects of the protocol do not work, and it was a necessary starting position to break the previous deadlock. But, like any deal, it requires fine-tuning in order to best protect the interests of all involved. The bill, no, sorry. the bill that has been brought forward addresses many of these issues. Practical measures, such as the Green Lane, Red Lane system, creating a two-tier regulatory system, are proposals that should and will be considered by the EU. As Donald Cameron alluded to in his remarks, retailers who have no stores in the Republic of Ireland are still required to meet EU standards just to ship their goods to Belfast for sale exclusively in Northern Ireland. This is clearly unworkable in the long term. The same can be said for the transport of medicines. My region, the south of Scotland, is home to the major ferry port at Cairn Ryan, Scotland's largest export point for goods to Northern Ireland. If the protocol is not amended, it will continue to affect exporters in the constituencies of every MSP in this chamber, so it is in all our interest to support a re-evaluation of the deal's implementation. However, there are also, sorry, I'll go However, there are also political considerations to be made. Both parties to the agreement pledged to uphold the Good Friday Agreement. With the breakdown of power sharing at Stormont and the threat of a hard border in the island of Ireland, 
it is fair to say that the Good Friday Agreement is under strain. The UK Government maintains that the amendments it proposes to the Protocol will support all three strands of the Belfast Agreement, and it is clear that they are in need of support. Strand 1, relating to the Northern Ireland Assembly, remains unresolved, and Strand 2, which fosters cooperation between North and South, is under pressure. It is also clear that the third strand, which deals with East-West relations, is strained. For these changes to be implemented, Presiding Officer, it requires the agreement of both the UK and the EU. Northern Ireland urgently needs a government. The people of Northern Ireland require stability and certainty, and the UK and EU have a duty to uphold their prior obligations in the form of the Belfast Agreement. Those should be our common goals going forward, and I hope an acceptable compromise is reached that addresses the many concerns that have arisen on both sides regarding the protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Dowie. I now call on Neil Gray, Minister, to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, around six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Scotland did not vote for Brexit, and that requires a consideration as we reflect on the impact that it is having on Scotland, including uh, as the protocol chaos rumbles on. Today, we have heard much about the parlous state of UK EU relations and much of the UK Government's approach uh, to this bill. We have also heard a great deal about the negative impact their approach could have on the Scottish economy, both uh, our trading routes and our interests in the Trading Cooperation Agreement, as referred to in excellent speeches by uh, Jim Fairley and Fiona Hislop. To take just one example of how this bill carries with it wider implications, Scotland's leading researchers, already suffering the uncertainty of Brexit in previous years, face being frozen out of Horizon Europe. Collateral damage of the UK Government's ideologically driven agenda. Horizon Europe is globally unparalleled, offering a €95.5 billion Euros research and innovation programme from which Scotland has benefited greatly in the, in the past. The UK Government's response, a potentially smaller domestic replacement. Details to follow. The same paralysis is what we face uh, across the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, with all questions and queries about progress tracing back to the impasse on the protocol. Lest we forget, this is the protocol neg negotiated by Boris Johnson less than three years ago, which he hailed as a fantastic moment. Now, of course, UK government ministers claim that there are issues with the protocol which were unforeseen and unintended. But in the next breath, to justify this bill, we are told this week by the Foreign Secretary that the problems are, and I quote, baked into the text of the protocol itself. Both excuses cannot be true. If they are indeed baked in, you'd be forgiven for asking whether the Prime Minister even read his own oven-ready Brexit deal. And such are the contortions and linguistic gymnastics required for the UK Government to try to justify this embarrassing ideological nonsense that they are directly contradicting themselves. These are, of course, extremely serious issues that will be coming, uh, causing much consternation to many sectors in Scotland. But we must also keep in mind the wider context here, referred to by Paul Sweeney and others. That is the need to respect the Northern Ireland peace process and the rule of law, rightly referred to by Willie Rennie, possibly the one area I could possibly agree with in Willie Rennie's contribution. Uh, adherence to the rule of law is what underpins our democracy and our society. It is fundamental, a fundamental value that we hold dear in Scotland. Knowingly breaking it by passing this legislation could have far-reaching economic, legal and political consequences and should not be taken lightly, covered by Paul McLennan. As Ross Greer said, UK ministers' justification for trashing the protocol is that there is necessity. But as Theresa May said on Monday night, the very existence of Article 16, which allows negotiations on aspects of the protocol, negates the legal justification for the bill, uh, as offered by Fiona Hislop. 
And before closing the debate, I want uh, once again to stress the frustration and anger felt in European capitals as a result of this bill and the unfathomable and unforgivable damage it does to bilateral relations, as stressed uh, well by Sarah Boyack and by Claire Adamson. We have seen the UK government's actions condemned in Brussels, Berlin, Paris, Dublin and Washington DC by presidents and prime ministers appalled that a Western democracy would cast aside an international agreement it signed in good faith less than three years ago. And this is not just about the Northern Ireland Protocol, though important though that is. This is about our nation, as part of the UK, is perceived on the international stage. It is also further evidence of the importance of Scotland being able to take charge of our own affairs in future as an independent nation. Regardless of how this bill ultimately fares at Westminster, and I call on all responsible members of both houses at Westminster to speak up in defence of international law, the damage done by the UK government's actions will not easily be reversed. And it also begs the question, for what? What end is the UK government pursuing with this bill that justifies the extraordinary means? It cannot truly be the economy, as outlined by the Cabinet Secretary. The Northern Ireland economy is enjoying better growth as it has continued access to the single market. We are told that they are seeking to unlock the political impasse in the Northern Ireland Assembly to protect the Good Friday Agreement and restore power sharing at Stormont. If that truly is their aim, then they are falling at the first hurdle. The DUP is still refusing to share power with Sinn Féin, and more than half of those elected last month to the Legislative Assembly, the very body the UK Government claims it is protecting, have made their position very clear in a recent letter to the Prime Minister, and I quote, We strongly reject your continued claim to be protecting the Good Friday Agreement as your Government works to destabilise our region. Your claims to be acting to protect our institutions is as, fabric as, a fabric as much a fabrication as the Brexit campaign claims you made in 2016. So conclu to conclude, Presiding Officer, the Brexit referendum was supposed to answer the decades-long Tory party psychodrama on the relationship with Europe. Instead, six years hence, we, since that referendum, Scotland is still being held back by the Tory incompetence and ideology the majority in Scotland want nothing to do with. Breaking the protocol, breaking international law by pursuing this bill is not the answer. And if the Scottish Conservatives are true to their word on negotiation, there is a route Article 16 and renegotiate the terms of the protocol. But in the meantime, they should consider removing this bill, ensure that they do not break international law and get back round the table to negotiate with the EU so we all enjoy a more fruitful future with a better relationship with the EU. Here, here. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and that concludes the debate on Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. And there'll be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to take their seats. Thank you.